Um, record. Recording in progress. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Um, it is great to see all of you and uh, or, or and or feel your energy. Um, and uh, um, I am Mel Hauser. I use she they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club. Share screen and we'll, we'll orient everyone. All right. Tonight we're going to be talking about reimagining healthcare. This is uh, the fifth week of, of the month, and all month we've been talking about life reimagined in all the various domains. So it's uh, only only fitting that uh, that we cap up with um, what we do for a living. So um, uh, by way of introduction, uh, all forms of participation are okay here. Uh, looks like many of you have figured out um, that you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. You can, you know, you certainly don't have to look at the camera. You know, you can walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, all the things. And everybody's welcome. And because everyone's welcome, including people of all ages, we are very big about um, about safety and about consent. And so um, uh, we we uh, you'll you'll see me in a second. We have a content warning for um, for, for for some um, sh kind of shocking healthcare statistics uh, that I'll include at the beginning of 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 this presentation. Um, and uh, and we just ask that 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 that, that you use content warnings. You're, you're welcome to talk about um, you know a variety of topics. We just ask that you give content warning so people can listen with informed consent. But I would say that even though we're talking about healthcare, today is for education purposes only, not medical advice. Um, and just uh, because we, we really want to be um, respectful of people coming from a variety of perspectives, and sometimes it's, it's really hard to hear about um, traumatic experiences. We just, just individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting because we're not in a place to, to uh, be providing medical support in the context of Brain Club. Um, last bit of um, uh, access. Um, just a word about language. You'll hear me and maybe, maybe other participants tonight use identity first language. Um, I am autistic. Um, uh, that's in contrast to quote a person with autism. And people are welcome to use whatever language you use for your own self. Um, but um, uh, that just if, if, if you're new to Brain Club and you haven't heard language like that, I wanted to uh, set the stage that that's, that's where that comes from. Because for many neurodivergent people, um, uh, neurotype is not needing to be separate from identity. And so that's why I use that word. And, um, and, and, and uh, we, we welcome people to use whatever language for themselves um, that, 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 that they use to describe their own identity. Okay. All right. One more thing about access. Um, if you'd like to use closed captioning, they are turned on already. Um, you just have to toggle them on at your end to use them. So depending on your version of Zoom, you may see either live transcript CC, or if not, try the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And you can choose hide subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. Okay, now I'm ready. Um, so, uh, so, so, so some Brain Club regulars have uh, likely seen this slide like a million times, um, but hold on a second. While I'm um, I just want to make sure I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple of members of our team here co-hosts to let people in from the waiting room because I'm no longer gonna be paying attention. There we go. Sierra, Sarah, and Lizzie, can I make you co-host too? Just in case we have some backups. Sure. Great. All right. Awesome. Okay. So um I, as many of you know, um, I did not know really anything about brains until I became a parent. Um, despite having a whole lot of medical education, um, um, uh, and there I am as a picture of me on the left, um, uh, a, a pregnant a uh, week before I gave birth um, to Luna. And uh, here I was, a doctor who takes care of babies and knows all the things about child development. 
quote, all the things about child development. Yeah, no, I did not know all the things about child development. Um, and uh, Luna, I, I thought I had it covered. But Luna, Luna felt otherwise. Luna made it clear in no uncertain terms that my medical education like was profoundly inadequate for her needs. And it was my environment that was a, a problem. My environment was a mismatch for her needs. And she let us know in no uncertain terms that um, the world was too bright, too loud. Um, and, and, and so much of the defaults of like being a baby, like the defaults that were imposed on her and what that's supposed to look like, that did not work for Luna. And she let us know by screaming for two years. And um, healthcare, healthcare was a place that uh, Luna, um, so, so, so it's Luna's six now, and um, Luna continues to make it known when she does not feel safe. And healthcare environments were a place that Luna has never felt safe. And so many people, that is true for, except, um, People get the message that if something's hard for, for you and you look around and everyone else seems to be doing the thing, people get the message that there's something wrong with you. There was never anything wrong with Luna and there's never anything wrong with someone who feels uncomfortable in healthcare environments. But that's not the message that people receive. And so tonight we're gonna to be talking about part of reimagining healthcare is shifting that narrative from the healthcare system is expert to putting power back in the hands of patients who almost always know what we need as human beings and are the experts in our bodies and know when an environment is not meeting one's needs. So before we get into that, I want to share some background information that I think is, is pretty important. It's in, in fact uh, why I quit my job to start this organization. So I'm going to give a um, uh, actually, I, I, I tried to do a little animation and forgot that I did it. All right, so we're talking about in, uh, empowering patients, as I said, um, and uh, we're gonna also referring to the double empathy problem. So the double empathy problem is a term that, 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 that we refer to a lot um, during Brain Club. It's a term coined by autistic social scientist, Damian Milton in the UK, referring to rather than like one normal set of social communication skills and like everyone else, it's about a mismatch of worldview and a mismatch of communication styles that is responsible for misunderstandings. And there are so many misunderstandings in the healthcare system. Um, and um, what, 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 what we've come to learn in the past year um, that, that uh, is involved in building a connected, healthy community. So now my content warning uh, before I get into some background information. So I'm gonna show you like some pretty terrifying health data um, uh, particularly in reference to autistic people's health. And um, uh, uh, they're, they're, in, 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 so, in so doing, their mention of, of healthcare trauma, mention of premature death, suicide, and uh, a reference to ableism. So for the next, I would say for the next uh, three minutes, if, if um, you would like to shut your sound off or leave the room, I will be done with that in three minutes, I promise. And um, uh, uh, can, 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 uh, Sierra, can you tell me when three minutes is up so that I can be true to my word? Excellent, okay. So, um, Doherty et al. in 2020 did a study of autistic adults looking at uh, the, the barriers to accessing healthcare. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in this particular study, um, all, these were all autistic people, autistic adults, who had established primary care relationships, like they were an established patient. Um, and yet, of that group, um, almost 80% had difficulty accessing healthcare. It's not like they couldn't access healthcare because they couldn't get an appointment, like they couldn't get a practice to accept them. They had that and they still couldn't access healthcare. 
Um, and the themes of that study of the barriers of why they could not access healthcare related to three main buckets the environment, including like interactions with the environment, including with the people in the environment. So that included sensory processing, communication challenges with, with staff and, you know, of, of interdisciplinary staff. Barriers with the provider. It was perceived by the autistic people in the study that their, their healthcare providers had insufficient knowledge and skills to take care of them and that they had unhelpful stigmatized attitudes. In fact, in the same study, um, about a th only a third of autistic adults sampled even told their primary care physician that they were autistic, specifically because of fear of judgment. Whoa. And problems with the system. There are so many defaults in the healthcare system. You, know, you must fill out a 20 page packet to become a new patient. You must pick up the phone every time you want an appointment. Yeah, guess who rarely gets healthcare? Because um, the phone. Um, and the, 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 the culture of the healthcare system, and I get to say this because I was trained in it like you know um there, there's a hidden curriculum for, for for trainees that there's a correct way to be a person um i remember as a medical student you know hearing doctors talk about oh there's the patient with the list um as though there was something wrong about like organizing your thoughts and writing or, um, oh, there's a positive cell phone sign, meaning if someone were using a cell phone, that means they, they, they can't be in pain. Um, uh, so many people have chronic pain on their own. You have to do the thing. So there's just this, these myths um, that, 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 that are harmful, harmful for health. about this because autistic patients are dying. The average life expectancy for an autistic adult is 36 to 54 years. Um, and I didn't know that. When I first learned that, um, I flipped my lid. I was 37 and I had just received my autism diagnosis. The leading causes are cardiovascular disease and suicide. We're going to talk a little bit about what we've learned here um, in the past year uh, about uh, the cardiovascular system and in, 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 in neurodivergent people, um, not specific to autism, um, and, and, and suicide as a leading cause. Autistic adults have a four to nine times increased risk of suicide, and that risk is higher in those with lower support needs. Um, and it's been shown in the literature that pressure to camouflage or mask one's autistic traits is independently increased with, a, with, with risk of completed suicide. And so uh, there are so many messages that actively encourage camouflaging and masking. This is, this is not only bad for health, we talk about that at Brain Club every week, but it's, it increases the risk of death. Content Three minutes, Mel. Thank you, right on track, amazing. It's for someone who doesn't feel time, that was pretty good. Um, so, you know, when, when we launched All Brains Belong, and many of you have seen this graphic many times, we set out to improve the health of the neurodivergent community. And yeah, it would have been really easy to just open a medical practice and say, Okay, we're doing healthcare now. But I don't think that would help many people's health. Because to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we have to do everything. It's not just medical care. It's I mean, medical care is big, like you know, a huge unmet need. Um, but it's 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 social connection, it's accessing education, it's employment, it's all part of health. So removing the arbitrary distinction, part of reimagining healthcare. Um, is removing the arbitrary distinction between medical care and the rest of life, or healthcare and the rest of life, because it's all part of health. 
So uh, when I was in medical school and residency, um, I, 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 got, I got taught um, that there were co-occurring conditions more common for autistic people. But it was never really told to me or it, never, it didn't even seem like anybody was wondering why. There were like some, you know, some assumptions made. Um, but what we learned here in our first year at All Brains Belong, and, you know, we, 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 we don't have all neurodivergent patients, but we have mostly neurodivergent patients. Um, we, we, we were forced to zoom out and recognize some patterns because uh, uh, we're pattern matching systems thinking people um, that our patients had a lot more in common than being neurodivergent. What they had in common was different connective tissue. Um, the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, the blood vessels, the gastrointestinal tract, even the shape and, and uh, the, uh, presentation of the face were different. And turns out connective tissue holds the whole body together. And so a lot of the common medical conditions that neurodivergent people more commonly experience has to do with connective tissue. And because everything is connected to everything, one of our patients came up with, I thought a pretty profound quote. Um, they said, hey, the way you explain that to me, it kind of reminds me of a ball of yarn, where if you pull the wrong string, you make the knot tighter. Sounds like you have to find the right string to pull. Yup. But, but, but the problem is, that um, so many of the, um, so much of the healthcare system is so fragmented, right? So like the, the body parts are fragmented and like, well, we're gonna, we gotta take care of this one part. Um, and you know, we, 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 in the 15 minute appointment, we can't take care of the rest of the body. We take care of, anyway, it, it, it doesn't work. And in fact, some of the standard management for, from some parts of this big picture um, that, 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 that we call all the things because it doesn't have a big picture name yet. Um, it's because uh, mostly most, mo mostly all the people here have all the things. Uh, so so it's part of the standard management of some parts of all the things make some of the other parts of all the, the things worse. So for example, there is a, um, a, a, uh, a condition called POTS or uh, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome has to do with uh, when you stand up, heart rate gets, you know, really, really fast and people get really bad symptoms related to this. And I wonder if how many people in the audience even have that without maybe even having a name for it. Anyway, um, but, 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 but the point is some of the standard management uh, for POTS is compression. And Turns out when you have uh, really extra stretchy connective tissue that impacts your blood vessels, turns out if you compress those blood vessels, you cut off your blood flow. Well, it turns out that's not good for health. And that's just one of the many examples where some of the standard managers and some parts make the other parts worse. I made this slide and called it uh, uh, the, the many names of suffering and invalidation. Um, this is, uh, there are so many uh, medical conditions uh, that that have a lot of stigma associated with it, and patients who have these conditions, um, they often don't get their needs met, and the healthcare system doesn't doesn't um, frequently do a good job at meeting their needs. And uh, the last the last item on this list, long COVID. So um, in, in, in April of 2022, uh, we, we did some internal quality improvement um, looks at, at, at our practice, and we found that 70% of our practice had long COVID or long COVID-like conditions. And we're like, what? So um, we started learning about long COVID. And here's how we did it. We established a task force, not just of interdisciplinary clinicians, but of patients. We invited our patients and other members of the community with all the things 
Um, and we got together. We prioritized the value of lived experience. And we started the process of, of building a community village, a community village of learning and healing together. Um, we didn't know how to manage long COVID. Um, we didn't know a whole lot about all the things, despite me having all the things. I still didn't know the best way of managing all the things. Um, so, so we brought people together and we learned. And since we began that process, uh, we haven't had a single new case of long COVID in this practice, despite starting out with almost like the majority of the practice having long COVID um, because neurodivergent people, for, for those who don't know, neurodivergent people have higher rates of long COVID. Um, that's a known thing in, in, in research um, uh, uh, related, to, related to the immune system, um, just high, higher risk of complications from COVID, including long COVID. So it wasn't like, I mean, it was 70% was really surprising to me, um, but um, we, we, we has having um, more neurodivergent people in a, you know, concentrated area, uh, we, we, we were going to see more long COVID than, than other primary care practices. Um, but to turn that around, to say, by shifting the script and empowering patients to be part of learning and healing together, that's how we've been reimagining healthcare. So because instead of zooming in to the different body parts, it's zooming out and seeing the big picture. And like all of the many, um, you know, that we say this like probably in every brain club in one context or another, that safety and regulation and co-regulation between people, that's, that's the path to health. Um, and so bringing people together, um, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 many of our patients come here because they're, they're looking for connection. They're looking to meet other people, navigating similar health challenges. Um, they're, looking, they're, 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 they're looking to engage in the broader community. Um, and, and, and that has been, that piece alone is such a, um, it's, 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 when I tell people we do that, um, like healthcare people, when I tell healthcare people we do that, they're like, but, 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 but HIPAA, like, uh-huh. Um, we, in fact, can not violate HIPAA and help the people get their health needs met, turns out. Um, there's so many myths about what healthcare has to look like. And as I showed you, it doesn't work. So. I had a couple of ideas of things I was wondering um, from 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 you, but we can talk about we can take this in any direction folks want to know. Um, maybe we can talk about what you wish what you wish healthcare looked like. Maybe what some strategies you found helpful to get your healthcare needs met, um, or that that you've seen done. Um, or we can you know I'd just love to hear your comments about about uh, some of what you've seen so far. Hi, Mia. Welcome back. Hi. Uh, I think with healthcare, what we really need is we need, um, like, there needs to be sort of the social model needs to come into play and we need to get rid of the medical model that medicalizes people and people's differences and the neurodiversity. And we just need to... And it needs to be more person-centered. It's like too often there's like, um, okay, this is how we're going to do it rather than like, this is what we want to do. And like, yeah, um, I mean, in an emergency, it might be harder, but that's not to say that, that uh, it would be impossible and that what the page, what, what the patients feel is taken into account and they're not just seen as being difficult. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. You know, I, I, I did a training earlier today for, uh, for nursing students. Um, and what came up was, uh, was exactly what you said, um, that, that, you know, we, the healthcare system often talks about patient centered care, um, but it's, it's not the, it, the fault is not of the individuals in this. It's the system. The system is, is, is uh, developing like the opposite of customized um, individualized care a lot of the time. Becca. Um, well, I kind of have two things, but one, I, I feel like even just getting access to health insurance is a, a hard thing. Um, I recently moved to Vermont and so had to switch my insurance and had to do it in this very stressful tight window of open enrollment and um, had the experience of like the way that the information was presented when it was like being sold to me was different than the information packet I got in the mail after signing up and basically misunderstood what would be covered and what wouldn't be covered. And so I think yeah, some sort of assistance to even just navigating how to get health insurance so that you can get health care would be helpful. Um, and then also um, along those lines, just like, I feel like mental health care is kind of this like cherry on top. Like it's like this special extra thing that you get if you pay more or whatever. So it would be nice, especially like after you shared the like statistics of how helpful it would be to have easier access to mental health that um, I think could make a really big difference in the whole picture of a human. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Beckett. I'm so sorry that you've had to go through this as, as so many people have. Health insurance makes no sense. I don't understand health insurance. Um, I ask, like, uh, we have a resource coordinator here at All Brains Belong who works with our patients to understand um, so many of the, the and overcome so many of the barriers to like things outside of our organization. Um, I, like I, Amy tells me everything about health insurance because I don't understand it and I'm a doctor. Um, it's so hard and it's so unfair and it's so, it's so awful. And yes, um, the other thing is that, you know, I think, uh, you know, when you, when I think the healthcare system really unhelpfully makes a distinction between physical and mental health care. Like this is, this is one thing and it's health and it's, it's, it's treated by, by separate systems. Um, and, and, and that's not helpful. Um, and, and so, you know, so often, um, you know, people tell us the stories of, you know, their, 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 the initial explanations for their symptoms of all the things um, oh, well, you know, uh, you must be anxious. Um, yeah, I, I would be anxious if my heart rate were 150 also. Like, yeah, that feels really awful. Um, but, but like, the, just the idea that it's like, it, 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 that, that they're mutually exclusive. And that's, that's so, so, not just unhelpful, but it's, it's harmful. Like, it's harmful. It's harmful to tell people that, 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 that anything is in your head. Yeah, it's in your nervous system, the one that goes through your whole body. Emily has a hand up, Mel. Oh, sorry. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, Emily, you have to be. It's hard to, to see. In, yeah. No, you, and you're also in my periphery. You're in the, you're in my upper left corner. Um, I'm so sorry for not seeing you in my peripheral vision. Yeah, no Go problem. Go for it. Zoom updated to a it's like a it's normally yellow and now it's like skin tone which like I don't think I actively chose so, <laughs> um very strange <laughs> um anyway um I was gonna um say that the the thing that I find most frustrating is that um it feels and I don't know if it's just a you know where I live but the primary care system doesn't seem to function as I think that it should um, so my primary care doctor will see me and refer me to all these specialists, and then the specialists will give contradictory advice. So like one will say, hey, take this NSAID for all your inflammation. And then the allergist will say, stop taking the NSAID because of your gut biome. And I'll be like, oh, but these two doctors told me to do these two different things. 
and I understand that I might need one. And then I'll, I'll want to ask somebody who knows more about medicine than I do. Um, okay, so there's risks and benefits to each of these. And please tell me all of the information so that I can make, you know, what are the potential harms and helps that are going to be caused by taking this medicine or not taking it so that I can then make an informed decision. And nobody has the time to do that. And they don't know each other's specialties. And then my primary care physician doesn't it, you know, have the time to, because, because of the way the system works, not because she doesn't want to, I think she's wonderful, but, um, and, and so that's where I'm like, I wish that there was just somebody who could actually, that they would, the specialist would tell the advice to the PCP who then would go through my options with me because like, I don't doubt that it's a real thing that I should both take NSAIDs and not take them, but that is actually not possible and I'm gonna have to pick one. And I would like to make an informed decision with somebody who knows more about medicine than I do. do, -do, -do. Healthcare, yes, I am, yes, yes. Um, like, so, so uh, I, I, I um, that story just, encapsulates so much of of the problem uh and 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 you know we hear we hear versions of that story all day um because that's what goes on um you know the the you know uh, the piece of education or the strategy i might i i i i i i i might um offer is that since you do have a good relationship with your PCP, um, to be, um, a, 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 to the extent that you feel comfortable going in with a clear agenda. I am here to talk about the conflicting advice between these two specialists so that you can actually have someone who, quote, knows more about medicine than you do thinking through that with you. Um, because um, otherwise it's, uh, how could you not feel overwhelmed and confused and super stressed out? I'm reading in the chat, um, uh, Sunrise shares, I wish I had a doctor who understood autism. I'm fairly newly diagnosed, so I'm talking about past experiences. When I would give my true symptoms, I was treated as if I were lying and not believed. That is so common. We hear that all too often. When I put those past experiences together, they point to typical symptoms that those on the autism spectrum have. Yep. Um, probably, or po sorry, I, I, uh, my dyslexia gets uh, gets gets in the way of of of, of reading often. Uh, possibly neurotypical people lie, but as but as is typical of a neurodivergent person, I do not lie. Uh, wish I had been believed and might have been diagnosed earlier. My diagnosis came at age seventy two. And some of my confusing life experiences would have had clarity. And some of the losses I grieve would not have been losses. Amen to that, Sunrise. Thank you for sharing that. And and I I, I think that, and, and this is what I what I shared with the, the nursing students that, that, that I presented to earlier today. The system, like like the, the medical education system contributes so much to the experiences that you had. Um, you know, in, in, in medical school, I was taught that like people who have this particular symptom, they present this way. And like, as though there were like one way to present, it makes no sense. And when you're thinking about, you know, uh, the natural diversity of human beings, uh, people are going to experience things in all, all different ways. And I think that, um, you know, especially in the case with, with, um, sorry, with, with, with all the things, this, these uh, multi-system, um, immune, neurologic, uh, hormonal differences that, that, that most autistic people have, um, there's no training about that at all in medical school. Reading in the chat, CV says, I wish I could text back and forth in medical appointments, but it's not an option. Access to mouth words and processing others' responses in 10 to 15 minutes is inaccessible. Absolutely. So um, one thing, and again, this is part of the ableism of the healthcare system, is that uh, 
the onus is on the person with the disability to come up with their own accommodations. That is ableist. Um, uh, and um, uh, I can I can share with you that at, at 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 in our healthcare practice, we text back and forth with our patients all the time. I wonder if you tried asking for um, you know whether whether it's using your phone using, you know, if you bring your laptop and you type something, whether, um, anyway, just, just bringing that up and asking for it, you shouldn't have to ask for it. I'm upset. That, I'm, I'm upset as an understatement. I'm really pissed off that you have to ask for it. Um, and most people don't even know they can ask for it. Um, you know, we think that um, inclusive design offering flexible multimodal ways of engagement to all people, not waiting for someone to disclose a disability, um, but to all people, we think that's better. Um, and short of that, you can ask for things. Um, and it is really hard to come up with your own ideas, um, but you have the idea already. Um, and it's really hard to advocate for yourself in an imbalanced power dynamic. So um, maybe that maybe that suggestion is useless. Um, in, in in but but I just wanted to put it out there um, that 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 uh, you are allowed to ask for things, and maybe the idea maybe the thing is to think about what might make it safer to ask for things, whether that's bringing someone with you, making your request ahead of time. Um, reading in the chat, um, I think uh, like most autistic people, I have a long list of ICD codes, that's a, a diagnosis codes, um, and uh, they, they see this and automatically think that I'm exaggerating my symptoms or something. Or maybe I am deemed way too complicated even before I open my mouth. Yup, yup. Um, reading, I'm reading from Kat, and I think probably Kat, maybe you typed this when when uh, um, Emily was 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 sharing their story. Um, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, that is what a PCP is for. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and uh, uh, Christina adds, even when I attach to a giant document. Um, that was categorized and specific symptoms listed and even links sometimes they don't read it and they want me to go over all of it right there in the visit in a short time. Yeah, and, and, and um, you know, that may be conflicting access needs, but that's not what's presented to you. So in our practice, we try to have, um, you know, like just open conversation about conflicting access needs. So if someone prepares, you know, a really um, thoughtful document, um, it's my access need because of my dyslexia. Like I can't just like read a bunch of emails. I got to print it out. And I got to highlight it. And I'm going to do that with you during your appointment. I'm going to read what you wrote and you're not going to have to rehash the whole thing. But we're going to do it in an appointment because it's, it's so, it's, 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 it's laborious and I'm going to do it because you put in the labor of, of, of preparing the thing. Um, but but that's not what's communicated. It's just like, oh, yeah, tell me what you're here for. Um, when this is all about access needs, I think conflicting access needs is the key to the universe. Um, Sarah and then Mia. Yeah, I was going to say about access needs. I was talking to a friend recently who was asking for support around going to a doctor and, you know, what might make it easier. And the conversation centered around things like, well, bringing a legal pad with you to write notes down or, you know, having notes, um, taking notes uh, while you're at the appointment. Um, just all kinds of different things that might be helpful. Um, and I wound up reflecting on my experience giving birth and realizing that I have two children and the first birth, I didn't really know that I had rights. I didn't know how to advocate for myself in the system. And um, consequently, I didn't have a lot of ownership over the experience. Um, and in between my two children, I saw the documentary Business of Being Born, and it was a completely different experience the second time around. And what I was reflecting on recently um, 
in my second birth was that I had um, a birth plan, you know, a document that was at the door and anybody who walked through that door needed to read the birth plan. And what I was reflecting on is that really my birth plan was me stating my access needs. So, you know, it was like, I wanted low level lighting, or I didn't want a thousand med students coming in and out of my room while I was giving birth, like all of those things and recognizing now through the lens of access needs that that's really what that document was about. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's so that's 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 so yes. Thank you for sharing that. Mia and then Becca. Yeah. Um I think uh what was said about people not always knowing they have certain rights. I mean, I really don't know a lot of my rights and I do feel, because of having an abusive past, I do feel quite intimidated asking for them because I worry people might think I'm, uh, yeah, and I mean, I haven't had any particularly bad experiences in the, in like physical health, but with mental health services, a lot of people have made me out to be the problem. And I think also, I was talking with someone today and they were saying about how um, when it comes to mental health, a lot of us, a lot of these things are created to, um, to sort of, because they don't want us to be in a state where we can question the status quo and how so much, um, so many natural human uh, reactions to things are sort of made are like made out to be sort of disorders just because like I think when we're, when we're sort of in a good when we're in when we're in the place to when we're off um, when we're in a good place we can mentally we can sort of stop and just question the whole system and that isn't a lot of people don't don't want that a lot of people in the system they don't want us to or, or or they may not be able to because they may not have access to their cortex either um mm. even you know and and, I, and uh after, I, i'm i'm, I'm going to write this down so i don't forget because it's not my turn yet uh becca go for it um yeah just thinking about access also i um so i was diagnosed like a little over a year ago at age 35. And in my health insurance experience, also learned that certain ASD uh, services are covered. And it seemed, and I could be wrong, because again, I don't fully understand health insurance, but the way that the information was presented led me to believe that the sessions with my mental health provider would have been covered if I were under age 22. Like for some reason, there's this like age cutoff for any sort of services related to autism, which I don't know if that is all insurance or just mine. I have Blue Cross Blue Shield, which seems like a relatively universal health insurance. So anyways, that was also a strange thing to learn because obviously like autism doesn't go away when you turn 22. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yes. so many are diagnosed later in life. So it's like, well, then can I get the 22 years of care that I didn't get <laughs> back then now? Um, yep. Yeah. No, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. There are these like, um, these boxes, these like really arbitrary anyway, and, it's, and like services, um, you know, it, 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 it anyway, things are, 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 are not created equal and insurance makes distinctions between, um, you know, uh, mental health support and occupational therapy. Um, and like, just as, as, and, 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 and both are very much, uh, supporting that. I mean, I, 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 uh, one of, one of the, 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 the most common supports for mental health, uh, that, that, that I refer my patients is to occupational therapy. Um, and, uh, anyway, yes. So confusing. 
Um, what I what I what I also wanted to add about Mia's point about um, difficulty dif dif difficulty with um, like asserting rights and feeling like um, there's the the that the, the, those in power don't 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 want you to. I think it's even um, it's 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 even more basic than that. I think in a lot of instances, which is that. Um, the system dysregulates patients and healthcare providers. The system dysregulates everybody. It's the system. Um, and so uh, dysregulated people don't have full access to their cortex. Um, and so, so often, um, you know, you and, 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 and um, I, I don't remember what month it was. It might have been like June or July. One of our healthcare related brain clubs, uh, we had a, a, a nurse on a panel who was talking about um, how, you know, uh, she was, you know, made to work like a, like a 17 hour shift and like taking care of all these patients and feeling so awful that she couldn't do the right thing. And like, that this was typical, like, um, uh, the, the, the in, inhumane working conditions, um, is, is, is really common. Um, and the, 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 there, there's 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 so many people who don't have their access needs met who don't even know that they have access needs, including unrecognized neurodivergent people. Um, so it's 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 such a messed up system. I'm just catching up in the chat. Sorry for missing all this. Sometimes insurance can deny things because the person in medical billing made a typo and wrote the wrong medical code for something, which results in hours and multiple in multiple phone calls and autistic nightmare. Mm hmm. Um, and CV's adding, yes, it's so frustrating. I tried to reach out to disability services to advocate for the millionth time in a medical facility and you could only call them, no messaging or email to access. Yep. Um, Kelly says, it seems that even our health is being viewed from a, what will keep the status quo lens rather than, than, than what do we need, right? Systems perpetuate systems. And this is, this is a very big system that is designed to perpetuate the system. I, yes. Luna is singing in the hallway. Um, I, 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 I wonder, has anyone had any good healthcare experiences or any strategies that they've personally found helpful that, that, that others might be able to learn from about like things that, that they've done or, you know, things, things that kind of worked out. Um, Kat sharing one of my favorite specialists when I first met him gave me the option to choose between a short visit where he basically told me what he thought I needed to do or a two hour visit where he taught me about my condition and then gave me suggestions to consider. I chose the long visit and took pages and pages of notes. And even though he saw that I wrote it all down, he printed out his notes for me too. I got a whole file. That's pretty interesting. I love that story. Wow. I think that story is going to be hard to beat for sure. But any, 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 anybody else have any, any stories of things that have gone well? Linda? I, I have had enough experiences where I went in and I said, this is happening. And I was told I was wrong. And we go through this dance five or six visits. And then I ended up being right. And between that and now being technically old, I finally just started to tell people, no, I am right. And go ahead and do the test. And then we'll meet back to discuss what we need to do next. And they say, well, it won't be covered. And I said, well, once you find that it was needed, we can go back and recode it. And that has worked a couple times. So. I guess part of our system to remake the old system is to reinforce each other that we actually do know what our body is doing and we know our kids and we know our families and we're right. Amen. That's right. Because how could it not be true that an individual is the expert in their own bodies? How could that not be true? It's obviously true. Yes. 
Um, Emily's adding, uh, my PCP is only allowed to spend so many minutes with each patient. So when the time's up, she asked me to message her through the system. She spends an hour after work each day responding to everyone's messages off the clock. I love that she does this, but wish she didn't have to. Yeah, you know, so so it's a it's a conflicting access need thing. Um, and, you know, I think that um, while when if you work for a system that tells you that 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 uh, violates your own autonomy as, as a professional, as far as how much time you spend with people. Um, but 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 maybe that doesn't have to uh, limit how often you can see them. So if you run out of time, you run out of time. And then, you know, but, but, but again, the system also is a barrier to that work around because then, you know, there's another, you know, there's maybe not any room in the schedule for another three months uh, because the system is set up to incentivize the system to over admit patients despite the lack of capacity to fit them into the schedule. Um, it's, it's, it's the system perpetuates the system. Uh, Christine is adding, Linda, that's so hard to hear that you had so many appointments for them to agree with you. Um, every appointment's a challenge for most of us. And I give up a lot of the time before I get what I need. Yeah. And that's all too common, all too common. Um, I, I presented a couple of weeks ago at um, for for Academy, which is a really cool autistic led organization in the UK. I presented on on on, on all the things, um, and uh, we we covered. And Lizzie, can you link to that in the chat? Um, uh, Sierra and I prepared a, 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 some some like strategies for how to talk with your healthcare provider. And anyway, so there's some like practical tips in that recording uh, that we'll that we'll that we'll get in the chat. Um, um, but, uh, in, in, in summary, I think like two, two of the strategies that I talked a lot about on that recording, um, were the idea of like scripting what you're going to say ahead of time. Um, because, uh, if you're in dysregulating environments with the overhead lights and the clicking, uh, the, the clicking, ticking clock. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, it's hard. It's hard. And then you get, you know, you have the pressure of the 15 minute visit and it's just, you know, that. Um, so being really, really being uh, specific um, to uh, 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 about, about what you want to make sure you get across that um, and bringing someone with you, um, not just to like take notes for you, um, but, but to like co-regulate you. Um, you know, if, if, if you're used to being othered and invalidated by the system, you go in there and even before anybody walks in the room, you're dysregulated a lot of the time. Um, so so co-regulation is, is, is really important. Reading in the chat, Sunar says, for six years, I was seen in a community health clinic. I had no insurance and paid a percent of my salary for visits. A physician assistant was the best provider I ever had. Um, I am a question box and of course have been shunned for this by some. But this provider would find on her computer screen a website with the answer to my question, and she, in effect, over a period of time, taught me medical websites that I could find answers. She never questioned my symptoms. She accurately diagnosed my uh, benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, and she provided care for my broken wrist, which mended with absolutely no residual effects. And she taught me to exercise the wrist daily to keep it from losing um, its, uh, yeah, I think range of motion. I think that's a, good, I, I, that's a term I'd use too. Um, I felt so safe and well cared for by her. She has gone on to be in some type of rescue medical person for those needing medical attention on wilderness trips. And I bet she's happy in her work. At least I hope so. Oh, 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 yeah. You're saying goodbye. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and Kelly says, because my husband isn't facially expressive, they don't believe his pain, right? So, so yeah, he isn't formally diagnosed, can't afford it, but he presents textbook autistic. Yeah, so he can't get his arm fixed. Oh, man. Right, because the... the uh, the one right way to present in pain thing like that makes that's how could that possibly be true is obviously not true so sorry <sighs> um <sighs> health care
the opioid crisis has made this harder, I think. Yeah, you know, I think that there are, talk about conflicting access needs. I think um, many healthcare providers um, have been taught certain things. There's regulatory requirements. There's like threats of like losing your license. And like these threats are real, they're really there. Um, and, you know, I think like I think like we say in so many instances that transparency is the way out of chaos. And I think that naming that naming like if people could just. People within the healthcare system name the stresses and pressures. I think that's the first step, right, of transparency so that your your patients don't think you're judging them. Because, you know, it's interesting when uh, Sunrise gave the examples of what her provider did that was so helpful, some of it was so basic. And it, it sounds like, you know, just the uh, never questioned my symptoms, told me she believed me. Sometimes that is, that is the most therapeutic thing someone can do. Um, and I think that, you know, yeah, uh, most healthcare providers are not going to know anything about autism. They're not going to know anything about all the things. Um, it's it's um, it, it, it it's 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 about being able to say I don't know, but I believe you. I don't know, I believe you, and I'm going to work with you to 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 figure out this together. And that's a that's a paradigm shift, and that is, I think, another really important part of reimagining healthcare. So I appreciate all of you being here today and, and joining in this important conversation. Um, and uh, uh, we, we hope you'll join us back next week um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to for, hold on, I'm just reading the chat. Um, Becca says, someone who's recently moved, I don't have anyone come to appointments with, but I love that idea. And it'd be awesome to have a volunteer group. Yeah, you know, we talk about that in our in our medical practice a lot. And I think that's what kind of one of the one of the the, the things about building community. Um, and and I think that, you know, that's this 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 is a place that, uh, you know, that, that that you can meet friends at. Um, and uh, there's there's so many people that that that, that, that don't don't have that connection. Um, and that's that's like one of the one of one of the things um, uh, and, and, you know, that's 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 an important part of health is having is having those community connections or social connections. So please, please, please keep on coming here. Um, and uh, next 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 week, we're going to kick off uh, our theme urgency culture, the impact of urgency culture on our health. Uh, preview. There's bad impact on health from urgency culture. So next week uh, is urgency culture and internalized ableism. So we, we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Have a good week, everybody.